So welcome everybody to the session this afternoon. Uh, the session is entitled Notable Women of Muncie, Agency in Action, 1870 to 1920. My name is Jim Connolly. I'm from the History Department. I'm chairing the session. And I'm going to welcome uh, our presenter, Samuel Steck, uh, who will speak on Josephine Jones Pearson uh, as part of the Notable Women Project. Um, Linda Laws and Anna Osborne will present jointly uh, on Carrie Gillenwater. Uh, and then Lauren Lathan, also from Ball State, uh, will uh, present on Dr. Anna Lennon Griffin, a disgraced Muncie doctor. So three very engaging presentations. Um, I'd like to proceed in the order that you're listed in the program. So uh, Samuel, you can start us off, please. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Samuel Steck. I am a freshman here at Ball State uh, with the Ball State History Department. Um, and I'm going to be presenting to you um, a project that was put together in my um, history, uh, Intro to History and Historical Methods class. Um, this was not a solo effort. This was a collaboration um, with a couple other students, namely Dylan Meyer, Leah weisbecker Lodz, and Justin Willis. Um, I will be solely presenting today. However, they deserve lots of the credit for much of the research and ideas presented here in this presentation. So this is the only photo we have of Josephine that we know of. And you can see she's there right on the far left. Even in this only photo of hers, she's literally overshadowed by her husband. And I think this is so indicative of a larger, problem within history and historiography with regard to Black women. The socioeconomic uh, systems that run up and down this country's history that constrict um, and constricted Black women, especially around the turn of the century, these systems allow, did not allow those like Josephine to, do, to document their existence as freely as, say, a white peer of theirs might have. Josephine couldn't go and simply get her picture taken whenever she wanted. She couldn't journal freely about her thoughts about her time and place in history. She was stuck with just this one family photo. And as a result, because of the lack of documents we have about people like Josephine, his, uh, historians tend to overlook those like Josephine, Black women living at the turn of the century. And we often forget the contributions they made in laying the groundwork for the future civil rights movement, which really took hold later in that same century. Um, Josephine also represents a growing civil life for African-Americans that is also overshadowed thanks to the lack of documents testifying to the existence of those like herself. And in this presentation today, I hope to show you all one example of how, one example of a woman who has been overlooked deeply by history and historiography and to show that despite a lack of documents of this time relating to Black women, this truly was a critical point in the history of African-American women in the United States. So before I begin, I would like to provide a little bit of context. I would like to talk about a nationwide event and a more local event. The nationwide event going on is that of the Great Migration. So following the Civil War and emancipation in the latter half of the 19th century, African-Americans started fleeing the South and escaping to Northern states. The African-Americans who left mostly came from the upper South, like um, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina. Those in the deep South weren't able to escape as freely, but those in those um, uppermost Southern states were able to leave, to, were able to escape the poor living conditions that they were increasingly finding themselves trapped in thanks to the implementation of, for example, Jim Crow laws. Um, and this great migration coincided with this, like a huge boom, an explosion of US industry that was allowing giant population centers, urban population centers in the North, such as that of Chicago, such as that of New York City. Um, the industrialization that was happening in these places allowed for a growth of industry and a boom of new jobs. And one place where industry took hold was right here in Indiana with the Eastern Indiana gas boom. So natural gas was discovered right outside the city of Muncie. And as a result, entrepreneurs uh, came into Muncie and transformed it from a small agrarian town into a booming industrial city. Um, as this was happening at the same time as the Great Migration, African-Americans were naturally drawn to Muncie. And, it's the, and 
the gas boom and the Great Migration's overlap is why stories of those like Josephine take place in Muncie. Now, another bit of contextualization I would like to mention is that of the club movement. Um, so at the same time as the Great Migration and the gas boom was revolutionizing life here in Muncie, there was much smaller, there was much quieter um, revolution that was happening across the nation. Um, and that was the club movement. Um, women uh, particularly organized into um, what, what started out as literary clubs, but quickly these grew into political organizations. Um, the activism that we saw in the reform-minded progressive era was largely spearheaded by these clubs, the fight for women's suffrage, the fight for prohibition. It was largely spearheaded by these new groups and societies that were being newly organized by women. Um, and when we think of the club movement, when we think of the progressive era and the women who, for example, marched for the right to vote, we largely think of white women and not for a bad reason. We, we understand that white women were very much at the head of this club movement, at the head of the fight for things like prohibition and for suffrage. However, to say it was merely white women is to overlook <laughs> Samuel, looks like we lost your audio. of her life. So take everything I'm about to say here with a grain of salt. Um, so Josephine's parents weren't actually born in Indiana. They were born in um, North Carolina, but moved during the Great Migration to uh, not Muncie, but Franklin Township, which is on the outskirts of Indianapolis. Her father, um, John Henry Jones, and her mother, Rebecca Jones, ran a small farm where Josephine spent her earliest years. Um, she was the youngest of four children, but was strangely the first of, the, of John and Rebecca's children to leave home. Before she was even 20 years old, she married in 1886 a man named Hezekiah Taylor Pearson, more widely known as Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, he was born in 1863 in Tennessee um, before coming with his family to Muncie, where he worked at the local post office and then at the Muncie City Ice and Cold Storage. So, Shortly after marrying, uh, Josephine moved in with Taylor in a home on East Seymour Street, which is in central Muncie, and was very near Taylor's workplace. Um, and within months of their marriage, they had their first child, Nettie Edith Pearson, who's a fascinating character in her own right and who we'll return to later on in this presentation. But what you may need to know now is that she graduated from Muncie High School in 1902 um, and married a man from Kentucky named George Riff, who, would who worked at the local bank in 1905. And these two would live with Josephine and Taylor until Nettie died um, in the middle of the 20th century. But when we got to the more mysterious of the two Pearson children is their second and final daughter, Ada Reba Pearson, who was born around 1887. Um, Ada married a man named Joseph Timberlake, who was also from Kentucky in 1903, and moved with him first to Hamilton, Indiana, but then to Indianapolis. We don't know a lot about Ada Reba Pearson. Her life is shrouded in mystery. Um, but we do have one very vividly described episode of her life, and that is of her 17th birthday party. An article in the uh, Muncie Star Press talks about how um, Josephine and her daughter Nettie hosted for Reba a really elaborate and just elegant 17th 17th birthday party for her. There was a three course luncheon, there was a flower arranging contest, there were over 40 guests. And I think that it goes to show what this, what this birthday party goes to show is that in addition to all the accomplishments about Josephine that I will mention later on, and there are a lot of accomplishments, you must also keep in the back of your head that at the same time, she's being not only a mother, but a dutiful and doting mother who was willing to incur a lot of costs and a lot of time to give her children a very luxurious and great childhood. Um, so moving on to just to why I titled Josephine um, Muncie's foremost black club woman, um, that starts at the Calvary Baptist Church, which Josephine has been a, was a member of since 1890 and remained for the rest of her life. Um, she was Josephine was a deeply religious person, and in 1926 she became a charter member of the Calvary Baptist Church's deaconess board, which she would remain for the rest of her life. In fact, she gained so much. Um, such a reputation within the church that in 1942, when the church was celebrating its 70th anniversary, Josephine was allowed to deliver a speech 
and she'd been with the church for 52 years at that point. Um, and her involvement with the church really opened a lot of doors in terms of getting involved with faith-based faith organizations. Um, so the first one I would like to mention is that of the Faithful Workers Club, which Josephine was a longtime captain of starting in 1908. We're not quite certain of the work exactly that the Faithful Workers Club did. However, given the name and given its meeting place, the Calvary Baptist Church, we can assume it was a faith-based organization of some kind. The one organization that was tied to the church that I want to mention was the Colored Women's Christian Temperance Union, which Josephine was a part of. Now, the Women's Christian Temperance Union um, you might know of, it was a very famous and very successful temperance organization that really helped uh, push for the prohibition of alcohol around the turn of the century in the progressive era. The Colored Women's Christian Temperance Union um, was the Black Auxiliary of that original organization. It doesn't get nearly enough press because um, it's crowded out by its white counterpart. However, it did a lot of important work in helping to get prohibition initiated in the United States. Josephine was involved with the Muncie branch of the CWCTU, um, but they did a lot more work than just advocate for temperance. They also, ad they also held, for example, a conference in 1917 on child rearing at the church. Um, and I think the, her involvement with the Colored Women's Christian Temperance Union is a signal for later political activism that Josephine later undertook. For example, in 1917, um, Josephine and a bunch of other Black women in Muncie uh, who were connected to the Calvary Baptist Church formed what was called the Booker T. Washington Franchise League. Josephine was a promptly elected uh, the new organization's vice president. Various newspaper articles that you can see here on the left attest to not only the Booker T. Washington's uh, role in the fight for prohibition, uh, not prohibition, for suffrage. Um, and it shows that white women were not the only ones fighting for suffrage, and that black women specifically were fighting not just for the right of women to vote, but also for black women to vote. They were um, advocating, they were self-advocates for themselves at that point and were critical in assuring that it wasn't just white women who gained the right to vote in 1920. Um, the Booker T. Washington Franchise League was also part of the growing, uh, what was called the Good Government Movement, which was sweeping the nation at the time. Um, a lot of the reforms of the Progressive Era were electoral reforms to help root out um, Gilded Age era political corruption. And a newspaper article specifically mentions that the Booker T. Washington Franchise League advocated for reform of ballots to make elections more free and more fair and make America a more democratic country on the whole. Um, but beyond politics, Josephine was also a member of various um, traditionally African-American Masonic and fraternal organizations. Now, by their very nature, these organizations are pretty secretive. So we don't know a lot about what they did. However, we know that the two main drives of these organizations was the social aspect and the charity aspect. Um, for example, uh, Josephine was an elected officer of the Muncie branch of the Knights and Ladies of Tavor, which helped to build, which helped to build hospitals for African Americans in the Deep South. Um, in addition to that, Josephine was also a member of the Order of the Eastern Star Number no. Eleven, which was explicitly a Christian organization, and she was also a committee member of the Muncie branch of the Grand Household of Ruth. Um, but what I think is super interesting on this slide is that Josephine was one of five women from Muncie who attended in 1920 um, the meeting of the Indiana State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs held that year in Crawfordsville. This is a really fascinating organization that could have an entire presentation dedicated to it. Um, but you can see in this organization's very existence that on the same level that white women were doing so at the same time, Black women were also organizing. They were bringing their clubs together. And Josephine was recognized as such a prominent club woman that she was invited to this conference. Um, the State Federation of Colored Women's Club in Indiana spread awareness for racial inequality in housing, healthcare, and employment. And also, can, <clears throat> also contributed funds to the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site in Washington, DC. Um, these are critical steps in establishing an African-American civil life um, that was only really starting to take off around the turn of the century, and also giving African Americans a sense of, of dignified history through the funding of the Frederick Douglass uh, historic site. And 
this is really where we can see much of the groundwork being laid for the civil rights. Josephine Pearson, despite her name not coming up in any history book whatsoever, is very much a forebear of Martin Luther King Jr., of Rosa Parks, of those prominent activists that we would see later on in the century. Um, but what was perhaps Josephine's magnum opus was that she was a charter member of the Phyllis Wheatley branch. Uh, she was a charter member of the Muncie branch of the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA. And there are lots of layers of racism and sexism present in just this organization's very existence. So the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA was the black auxiliary of the YWCA, which was in and of itself, the female auxiliary of the YMCA. So there was various degrees of separation here from the center of this organization. But thanks to the efforts of those like Josephine, the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA in Muncie became a place where black women could come together and engage in a wide variety of activities. Some of these were social activities, such as tea parties, picnics, dinners, and baseball games. But the organization was also helped to spread political activism to a new, younger generation. For example, they held meetings of the NAACP and um, recognized various, uh, observed various holidays, such as Racial Reconciliation Day. Um, and what I like to see, what I think is here is that Josephine is spreading her very much present activism, her very much present political activism to a whole new generation of young black women in Muncie. Um, and we'll see this legacy with regards to the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA come up a bit later, but for now, um, Josephine, I would like to mention that Josephine died on December 5th, 1947. Um, somewhere between the ages of 82 and 87. She far exceeded the lifespan of a Black woman of the time, which was just 62.9 years. Um, within a decade of her death, um, nearly all of her family um, would not, uh, would, would die alongside her. Her husband would die um, in 1955, Nettie would die in 1951, and Ada, the last living of the family, would live until 1962. But what I would like to talk about to conclude this presentation is that of the legacy Josephine left behind in the form of her daughter, Nettie Pearson, also known as Nettie Riff. Um, she was identified as a young age, at a young age as a refined and bright woman in many local newspapers. Um, she graduated Muncie High School and married George Luther Riff, as I've, <clears throat> as I've said, but she also attended Ball State College and even studied social welfare for two summers at the Wellesley College. Um, she became a secretary of the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA and later became the organization's executive director. Um, and in her position as executive director, she trained many young women in a variety of skills um, and helped to expand the Muncie branch of the, Phyllis Wheatley, of the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA's reach across the city. She herself would die at the age of 68 in 1951, but we can see the influence Josephine had on her daughter and also on younger people in general, spreading her activism to uh, younger Black women who would later take part in the civil rights movement through her involvement in these clubs and organizations such as the YWCA. So in conclusion, uh, while Black women of this time around the turn of the century in America are often overlooked and um, often overshadowed by their counterparts who partook in the civil rights movement, this was a deeply critical moment in African-American history, especially in the history of Black women. And Josephine is a perfect example. She encapsulates perfectly the, organi the work of the organizations that were being formed at the time in laying the groundwork, building up the infrastructure that would lead to the civil rights movement later on in the century. It's a shame, I believe, that Josephine in her story is forgotten and that even here in Muncie, we don't, you wouldn't even know her name. Um, but she did so much, not just for her community, but for the nation as a whole. And she really represents a whole new generation of Black women that were coming to the forefront at that time. So, thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Samuel. Um, we will have uh, time at the end of the session for questions and comments and discussion for about all three papers, but I want to make sure that all three papers get presented first, so I'm going to hand it off to Linda Laws and Anna Osborne uh, for their presentation about Carrie Gillenwater. So uh, go, go right ahead. Uh, I think it's Anna that's sharing her screen. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Osborne. 
And I'm Linda Laws, and we completed this project over Carrie Gillen Waters. We also present created this project with another lady, Virginia Carter. However, she's presenting on a different panel in the history conference. So it will just be me and Anna presenting today. Carrie Gillen Waters was an African-American woman who lived in Muncie, Indiana during the early 20th century. She was born in Carleton, Kentucky in 1885. This is an estimated year, of course, which we will talk more about later. She moved to Muncie later on with her mother and brothers following the larger trend of African-American migration from the upper South to the Midwest in search of industrial jobs. Her experience living in Muncie was unique, receiving a formal education and holding employment with an influential local family, although her race, gender, and class made up the foundation on which her experiences were built. Throughout her life, she, she challenged what we today perceive and assume was a normal for African Americans, especially African American women living in predominantly white small cities like Muncie in the early 20th century. Aspects of Carrie's story challenge our assumptions about what life was like over a century ago, in particular, her education, economic self-sufficiency, her two marriages and two divorces, in their place within the larger conversation and trends shows us that Carrie's life wasn't an anomaly, but proof that these assumptions are faulty. Since her death in 1931, we can look back and see that she encourages us to reassess our understanding of what roles African Americans, women of color, and working class citizens were able and allowed either by society or law to take on during this time. So while we do not know for sure why Carrie and her family made the move from Carleton, Kentucky to Muncie, we can assume that they had heard about the influx of factory work opportunities available during the gas boom that started in 1886. Knowing about the gas boom, I wanted to look for records of all the jobs that Carrie and her family held, um, that the rest of her family held. So finding a place to start the research can be a bit daunting at times. So I started all of my research on the uh, Ball State Digital Media Repository by typing in various names and all of common misspellings that could come up. Um, and then I just went from there. Unfortunately for the Gillen Waters, um, there wasn't much on the DMR about them. The most I obtained were two Muncie City directories which showed their current job and their home address. Um, speaking of their home address, on the DMR, there's a collection called the Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps, which allowed me to situate them within the city of Muncie. Um, on the screen, the uh, picture on the right is the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map, and the um, picture on the bottom left shows where, uh, where she lived in relation to Ball State University. Um, moving on, I next utilized the website familysearch.org, uh, which definitely had more documents um, such as marriage certificates and census records, but still the most that could be taken from those were jobs, ages, and addresses. Uh, one really important thing I learned about familysearch.org um, after the project was completed was that uh, the website was originally created for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. and. Uh, it's even though it's completely open and free to use by the public, um, that could still be an explanation as to why there wasn't as much information as I expected. Um, so usually uh, we would look towards the father and see which job he got, but her father is not listed on any of the records we found. Um, our group assumed that he had either passed before they moved or um, uh, Carrie's parents had gotten divorced. So instead, Carrie's mother is listed as the head of household on two census records, so it's most likely the case that the group of them moved so Carrie's three brothers could find work. Um, like most women, Carrie and her mother, Leanna, worked as domestic laborers. Carrie was a nurse for the Marsh family and also a servant and housekeeper for other families. However, no other families were listed on the records, so it very well could have been the Marsh family that she continued to work for. Um, the census record lists Leanna as a house cleaner and a laundress. Uh, even Carrie's brother, Sydney, worked as a house cleaner at one point and later appears as a laborer, a carpet cleaner, and a porter at the Little and Oakley hardware store. Charlie, who is not mentioned as often in any records, is listed once as a laborer. And the reason I think that he is not listed as often is because his address is different on one of the, um, the census records 
And so we assume that he moved and they didn't really keep track of him along with the Gillen Waters family. Um, and finally, Jacob, the third brother, is listed in the city directory and a marriage license as a furnace man and a glass worker at the Hemingway Glass Company. Although Carrie herself did not work in a family or in a factory, the fact that the majority of her family did places her within the population of African Americans who moved to Muncie for the purpose of finding work during the gas boom. As Jack Blocker named it in his article, Black Migration to Muncie, the economic bonanza that ensued after the gas boom attracted many African Americans. And although census records would not tell exactly why a person moved to Muncie, they reveal that those who did found work. Aside from African-American migrants, Carrie and her family are included in the 5,000 plus people that migrated to Muncie from 1886 to the 1890s, now starting to become the largest city in the Indiana Gas Belt. Carrie Gillen Worlders, as mentioned before, worked after her family's migration to Muncie. She was a domestic servant who mostly cared for the children of the predominant family in Muncie during that time, the Marsh Ryan family. Something to know is that the Marsh, Marsh family was so influential in Muncie because John Marsh, the father, was the first banker in Muncie. It was his travel up the business ladder in the Ohio State Bank that led him to becoming the president of the branch in Muncie. This tad bit of information was interesting to look into. I found information about Mr. Marsh in, the book, in a book about the history of Delaware County that was published in 1924, meaning it was the history up until then. So there was some pretty interesting stuff in there. It was common for African-American women who participated in the workforce to be domestic servants. Some lived in the same house as the family who they served for and others lived elsewhere. As mentioned, Carrie and her family lived in their own home on East Seymour Street. Since this family had a high reputation, it's novel that there's a picture of Carrie with the Marsh children. Most domestic servants, especially those who were Black, would never be pictured with the family in which they served and the way this picture on the screen is posed. This is a peek into real domestic life where Black staff and white employers mix daily. These children probably cared much for Mrs. Gillen Waters. However, it was not common, though, for domestic servants to be posed in photography studios or be arranged in pictures like this one here. This is a novel image that is what really set us off to investigate Carrie Gillen Waters. After her migration to Muncie, and working some, Carrie did something not many people like her had the opportunity to do during this time period. She attended an institution for higher education. Indiana Normal School was a college in Muncie that has since become Ball State University. There are not many available records about the Indiana Normal School class sizes or graduations rates. In the catalog from the year Carrie attended, there was approximately 347 students attending, the majority white students. You can tell this because in the images of the catalog we looked at, there was an identifier near the names of the people who were not white. Many African American people could not afford higher education at this time, so there weren't many. Carrie attended higher education from 1907 to 1908. Her name can be found in the list of students from Indiana Normal School's catalog from that academic year. There are no records found to show if she continued on or not in her education. However, even only being able to attend if for perhaps only a year, it is still remarkable for a woman of her color and class. It was difficult to find information on her schooling because documentation was sketchy at best, then especially for African Americans. The only information I could find from Ball State was the catalog. I contacted other places to no avail, but that should not be a surprise because documentation of African American women was low. According to marriage licenses and newspaper articles, Carrie was married twice, first to Ernest Rickman in 1912, who she divorced in 1917, and then to William Worlds later that same year. She divorced Worlds as well in 1923 and took, cost, took custody of his daughter, who she had adopted two years prior. Carrie's marital history offers us a glimpse into several facets of early 20th century life. The politics surrounding marriage and divorce, how intimate partner violence was addressed and publicized, and now outlets like newspapers could control the public's perception of these, issue, of these issues, especially as they related to race. In both her petitions for divorce, Carrie cited ill treatment, claiming that Ernest gambled away their money and William had been violent and cruel. 
We know from newspaper clippings that Ernest was involved in several public domestic disputes. One report in 1911 included details of a fight in public between Carrie and Ernest, ending with both being arrested and Carrie being fined $1 for harming him. We, we know these details regarding Carrie's marriages and much of the information we have on her life because of the nature of newspapers during this period. Newspapers weren't just for spreading news of the wider world to a community, but for altering the community of the comings and goings of its citizens. Information we might now deem too personal for the public was printed, such as the guest list invited to someone's house for dinner, a family's travel plans, or in Carrie's case, marital issues. Most of our view of Carrie's life comes from the In Colored Circles section of the Muncie Star Press. When discussing how African American life was portrayed in the Muncie paper, especially as we try to sketch a person's life with it, it is important to remember the state of race relations in Muncie and Indiana at this time. The Ku Klux Klan had a dominant presence throughout Indiana in the 1920s. Navidist attitudes likely impacted the way in which newspapers reported on issues like domestic violence, which Carrie experienced in both of her marriages. While newspapers offer critical insight into the lives of those who would otherwise be unrecorded, we must keep in mind how they might have impacted Carrie and others in the community. When first beginning to research Carrie, our group struggled to figure out her year of birth. After looking at various marriage records, census records, her obituary, and her gravestone, four different years of birth came up. From 1900 census record, Carrie's birth year was 1881. From the marriage certificate with Ernest Rickman, it was 1883. From the William World's marriage certificate, it was 1889. And finally, from her obituary and her gravestone, it was 1885. While at first it may seem weird for one to not know their birth year, this was not uncommon at the time. In fact, most African Americans lived in states that did not enter the national registration systems until the 1925s, uh, until 1925 to the 1930s. Only in 1919 did all states finally have birth records, but even then they were not standardized until the 1930s. Even in death, registration did not begin until the late 1900s. And for African Americans, registration was much less reliable. However, this is where Carrie was unique. Carrie died in the year 1931, and like birth records, death registration was not common in most states until 1930. Even without death registration, we were still able to find Carrie's obituary that was written in the Star Press. Her obituary provides her age and names her cause of death and extended illness, which turned out to be a cerebral hemorrhage as written on the Beech Grove Cemetery listing. When I was trying to find more about Carrie's birth year and cause of death, I actually went to visit the Muncie Public Library, also named the Carnegie Library, because I knew that from their computers I can access Ancestry, which they offered for free. Um, what one of the librarians also taught me was how to use their database. Uh, yeah, how to use their database, which is something that can be accessed from anywhere, not just their library. Um, and it was on that database that I found the Beech Grove Cemetery listing. Um, Carrie Gillenwaters died at the estimated age of 46, surpassing the life expectancy age range of most adults born between 1880 and 1910, which were expected to pass at the age of about 38 or 39. Carrie's life and experiences challenged the assumption that African Americans, particularly women, were unable to operate independently or live fully due to the restrictions placed on them socially and legally in the late 19th and early 20th century and in non-urban settings. Carrie's education, employment, single motherhood of an adopted daughter, and legal autonomy and success in petitioning for her own divorces denote a colorful, successful, and self-sufficient life. Although she could relate to some stereotypical African-American women's suffrage during this time, Carrie was an example of how African-American women operated within and challenged the limitations placed on them. There is evidence that women just like her indeed exist, but it has been willingly ignored by popular interpretation. She did more than what most history narratives led us to believe. Carrie Gillenwaters is a lady to note about for the women of Delaware County in the late 1890s and early 1900s. Thank you. Okay, uh, 
uh, thank you to both Linda and Anna for that presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to our final presentation. A quick note as we do, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can um, place them in the chat box or you can use the Q&A feature or you can raise your hand using the little icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll start taking questions once we've heard uh, from Lauren. So now I'll hand it over to Lauren Latham, who's going to talk to us about Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin, a disgraced Muncie doctor. So go ahead, Lauren. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Okay, so um, my name is Lauren Latham and I'm gonna be presenting information about Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin. Um, she was a Muncie doctor who was once successful and then um, was disgraced later on in her life. So I originally developed this project with two other women in Dr. De Silva's History 200 course this past fall. Um, as a class, we were instructed to investigate the lives of prominent women in Muncie during the late 1800s and early 1900s, utilizing the context from this time and place. Um, so the following research is an accumulation of the work that my group put into the project to understand Dr. Anna Griffin's life as a woman physician during this time period. So as you can see, these are some photographs of a doctor's bag um, and some women doctors and classes and all together in a group from the late 1800s, which is the time period again that I'll be talking about. Anna Maneuver Lemon was born in Pennsylvania in 1858. We do not know much about her early life, but we found evidence of her work as a physician, and that's going to be the focus of this presentation. According to the alumni of the Women's Medical College of Chicago, Anna Lemon graduated from the, from, um, the Chicago Women's Medical College in 1888. In 1895, she married William Griffin and proceeded to obtain her medical license from the Indiana Medical Society in 1896. At the time, women faced many difficulties when they applied to medical schools. Um, the Women's Medical College was established in response to women not being able to gain access um, to uh, males' medical colleges. Um, unfortunately for the Chicago Women's Medical College, um, once acceptance of women became more common practice, the school experienced a decline in enrollment numbers, which forced it to shut down in 1902. In the late 1890s, Dr. Griffin moved to Muncie with her husband and then established a professional practice, which was listed in Muncie's city directory in the year 1900. She actually ran the practice out of her home. Um, she was listed as a physician and surgeon. Within the Muncie community itself, Dr. Griffin was a trusted physician. Uh, she was a member of the Delaware County Medical Society, and she also participated in a regular scheduled meeting between other Delaware County physicians in Muncie in 1896. And according to the Muncie Daily Herald, Dr. Griffin was complimented on her descriptions of the scalp by those who were present at the conference. Um, they were described as being of high order and it was reported that a discussion of her presentation occupied the remainder of the physician's meeting. Um, according to other primary source records, it also appears that she was a family physician. And from 1896 until uh, in 1903, Dr. Griffin's office was listed in the city directory on a regular basis. It was typically highlighted in the Muncie Daily Herald each week. However, the last city directory report of Dr. Griffin's office address and practicing hours was listed in 1903. So in general, it was difficult to obtain information regarding Anna Lemon Griffin's work as a physician due to the lack of documentation by Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin herself. Um, so we utilize newspaper articles, court records, medical records, and secondary sources to paint a picture of Dr. Griffin's experience. Um, according to Delaware County records, in the year 1900, two Muncie residents, Charles and Joseph Keating, were accused of murder. And Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin submitted a sworn statement to the Delaware Circuit Court of Indiana for the court case. Um, she was writing on behalf of one of the witnesses of the case, Mrs. May Jones. And Mrs. Jones was eight months pregnant at the time. 
And as her family physician, Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin wrote to the court to have her dismissed as a witness. She said that Mrs. Jones was unfit to act as a witness because she was in a fragile, irritable condition. Um, furthermore, Dr. Griffin also urged for, um, for Mrs. May Jones to be dismissed because she feared for premature labor or the death of the unborn child. However, after Dr. Griffin submitted the statement, the prosecuting attorney for the case wrote to the court urging for Mrs. Jones to testify. Um, and in a final statement in 1901, um, Dr. Griffin submitted, um, said that Mrs. Jones gave birth to a stillborn child and was in a weak state. And this statement implies that Mrs. Jones was forced to testify despite Dr. Griffin's protests. Um, and so although Dr. Griffin was not an active participant in this court case, her statement helped to establish her as a trusted medical professional in the community at the time. But it also acts as evidence of how women doctors were viewed by the contemporary community. Uh, Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin had warned the court about her patient's fragile condition and advocated for Mrs. Jones' dismissal, but um, it was implied that her sworn statement was not taken seriously um, because Mrs. Jones was still forced to testify. Uh, therefore, the role of Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin establishes the challenge for respectability that women doctors um, were faced with at this time. In the early days of our research, the primary source documents concerning Dr. Aaron Lemon Griffin portrayed her um, as a crazy ex-physician who had repeatedly attempted to harm her husband, William Griffin. Um, again, due to the lack of Dr. Griffin's personal documentation, we had to utilize other sources to learn more about Dr. Griffin's alleged state of mind. Um, so while I was searching the Delaware County court records, I found court papers pertaining to a divorce case. Um, in July, 1903, Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin filed a complaint with the Delaware County Circuit Court and she requested a divorce from her husband, William Griffin and a sum of $300 in um, damages. Um, she claimed that her husband had committed adultery and that he had neglected her while she was sick. Um, she also wrote that her husband had course, cursed at her um, which you can see below, I'm not going to say the words, but he called her words such as Mrs. Bile and indecent. Um, despite her pleas, Dr. Griffin's request for divorce and the monetary damages was denied. And the legal documents state that the complaint does not state facts to constitute a cause of action against this defendant. So essentially, the legal documents said that there was not enough evidence. Um, and so Dr. Griffin's statements imply that her marriage to William Griffin um, was for, full of turmoil. And however, she was not denied a divorce. She allegedly leaves him afterwards and her whereabouts are unknown between 1903 uh, when she filed for this divorce in 1906. And this information was crucial to our investigation because it shows that prior to the swarm of newspaper articles describing Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin's um, alleged assaults on her husband, Dr. Griffin herself had attempted to obtain a divorce from her husband as a result of abuse allegations. Um, therefore, we wanted to study the history of women and divorce in the 1800s and 1900s to contextualize Dr. Griffin's situation. So in the 1830s and 1840s, um, there were some laws enacted to protect American women's rights to their property. These statutes were titled the Married Women's Property Acts and Earnings Acts, and um, they were initially created to ensure that the property of married women would not be subject to her husband's creditors. And these were eventually reformed um, to allow married women to own and mitigate their personal property and wages. And so now that woman had the ability to independently um, act from their husbands um, and addition, in addition to this, um, the rapid urbanization that was occurring in the US in the 19th century allowed for increased economic individuality. So therefore there were many opportunities that opened for divorce and divorce became a more reasonable option to American women. Uh, the divorce cases actually increased from 1867 to 1906 
Um, it's likely that Dr. Griffin's complaint against her husband in 1903 contributed to these figures. Um, but despite the amount of divorce cases that were beginning to increase, um, the negative attitudes towards divorce prevailed during this time period. Um, for instance, specifically in Muncie in um, 1899, the rising amount of divorce cases in Delaware County compelled a um, Baptist minister, again in Muncie, to deliver a sermon on the evils of divorce. Um, the Reverend C.M. Carter um, said that the Bible and therefore God discourages divorce. So again, although the rates of divorce had increased in the U.S., there was a social counter movement um, among many um, social conservatives that aimed to create stricter divorce legislation. And this was the, um, this is where, Muncie is where Dr. Griffin was living. So the social counter movement was occurring at a place that she was living in, which might explain why she was not granted a divorce. But again, we do not know for sure. So now I'm gonna move on to um, the newspaper allegations made by Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin's husband, William Griffin. Um, multiple newspapers such as the Indianapolis Star and the Herald and Review engage in what appears to be a smear campaign um, targeted towards Dr. Griffin. Um, in a string of articles, uh, William Griffin is essentially saying that he is the one who wants a divorce. He is afraid of his wife because she has threatened to chloroform him and operate on him. Um, and he also said that she was using morphine. Um, but it's unclear whether she ever actually threatened her husband with physical violence. Uh, but again, the alleged threats obviously made headlines all over the country. Um, there were articles um, throughout the Midwest in several states. And in the early 1900s, especially in the Midwest, claims such as this could have severely damaged um, Dr. Griffin's reputation as a medical professional at the time. Um, there were already stigmas associated with divorced women at the time, as well as women doctors. So claims such as these were most certainly detrimental to her livelihood. Um, in 1905, five years after Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin initially filed for divorce and again, failed to receive one, William Griffin filed for a divorce and that divorce um, was finalized in 1907. So the aftermath of the newspaper allegations seemed to dramatically impact Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin. Her whereabouts between 1903 and 1906 were unknown until a Kokomo newspaper article was released in 1906. While traveling from Muncie to Logansport in August 1906, Anna Lemon Griffin sought out assistance of a sheriff in Kokomo because she feared her ex-husband was following her. Um, in a statement to the Star Press, Dr. Griffin claims that she had once enjoyed a large and lucrative practice, but had been constantly moving across the country to avoid being followed. Um, it was reported that she was an, unable to pay for a boarding house or transportation. Um, and in September of 1906, um, a year after Mr. Griffin's claims about Dr. Anna Griffin began circulating nationwide newspapers, the American Medical Association published a claim that she was deranged and was temporarily not practicing medicine. Um, according to the American Medical Association Journal, Dr. Anna Griffin was sent to the Indiana State Hospital at Logansport sometime in August of 1906. Um, so I'm gonna get into a little bit about morphine because we wanted to look at um, Mr. Griffin's claims about that. So um, Anna Lemon Griffin was brought up around the time that morphine began gaining traction as a common treatment. Um, soldiers fighting the Civil War were often treated with it when they sustained injuries. Um, and as a licensed physician, she had access to morphine. It is, not, um, it is not out of the realm of possibilities that these claims were, um, these claims are true. Um, and Anna would have also belonged to the upper middle class, which was the common demographic for morphine addiction in the 19th century as it was commonly used for the treatment of um, so-called female troubles, such as nervousness and lethargy. Um, due to the troubles with her husband, it is clear that Dr. Griffin 
was under an immense amount of stress. Um, she received a psychi um, she received a evaluation from the Central State Hospital in Indianapolis in 1908, um, and she was subsequently institutionalized. Um, the Indiana Digital Archives um, do not indicate why she was brought in or how long she was held. Um, we can only speculate that she was institutionalized because of the rumors flying around about her morphine use and supposed threat to her husband. Um, but it is also possible that she was suffering from uh, like um, immense amount of stress um, due to um, you know her attempts to maintain a career in medicine along with a crumbling private life that was made very public by newspaper articles. The breakdown of Dr. Griffin's marriage and professional practice led us to investigate the circumstances surrounding women physicians at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in medicine and in many other industries, educated uh, women found it difficult to enter a male dominated field. Um, and at the turn of the 20th century, uh, women were finally beginning to be taken more seriously by their male counterparts, but there was still a substantial um, gap in achievement between male and female physicians. Um, they, women during this time struggled more frequently within um, their own social circles because they were not just competing against the men, they were competing with um, each other because there was a limited amount of women who were allowed to um, uh, find um, jobs as physicians at this time. And that's due to um, social stigmas and, um, you know, women were portrayed at this time as domesticated maternal. Um, and if they did not fit that mold, they were often subject to ridicule. Um, so once Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin was accepted by her community as a trusted physician, um, this was a big deal because it was very difficult for a woman to find success and acceptance from their male peers and their communities at large. Um, despite this, Dr. Griffin was subjected to personal stressors in addition to profess professional um, stressors regarding her career as a physician. The fact that divorce was generally stigmatized in combination with the public allegations made by William Griffin likely contributed to the declining professional and mental state of Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin. While it was unclear exactly how long Anna was institutionalized, records from 1910 from a um, US federal census indicate that she had been released um, and was living with her brother and sister on a farm in Springfield Township, which is near Fort Wayne, Indiana. And her occupation was once again listed as a physician. Um, we can then infer that she was at least attempting to get back into practicing medicine at the time. Um, however, the only information that we were able to gather about the last part of her life, in fact, comes from census records. Um, again, in 1920, 10 years later, we see that she is listed as living with her siblings on her brother's farm, but at this time she was marked as unemployed. Um, with this evidence, we came to the conclusion that she had retired from the medical profession at this time. Um, Dr. Lemon Griffin died on May 14th in 1923 at the age of 65 years old. Her death records list her as divorce from William Griffin, but again, her occupation, occupa I can't even say that word, her job was listed as a doctor. So even though she was marked as uh, unemployed in 1920, by 1923, she was listed as a doctor again, which is significant. Um, in conclusion, Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin's life is emblematic of the ease with which a professional woman could fall from grace. Um, in the span of just a few years, she went from holding a reputation as a respected member of the Muncie community to a disgraced divorcee. The rumors spread by her ex-husband completely upended her life, both professionally and personally. And it became clear that a divorced woman would have had a difficult time maintaining a positive reputation at this time. It seems that the previous amount of respect from Dr. Griffin's community did not save her from the forces of social stigma. Um, it is unclear whether Anna ever made threats to operate on her husband or whether she was truly addicted to morphine. Um, it could be very possible that William fabricated all this because he was upset that she wanted to divorce him. Um, you know, this just shows the, the fact that historical research is filled with constraints um, 
this project demonstrated the complex nature of the past in general. Um, at the onset of this project, our goal was to research information about Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin's medical practice. Um, specifically, we wanted to look at her as a physician. That was the goal. Um, we did not expect our project to expose the decline of Dr. Griffin's um, personal and public life in addition to her career. Um, this theme, though, it appears to be um, it, it, it per, appears to be more poignant um, in her life experience as becoming a doctor. Um, there's more information about her divorce, um, domestic disputes, um, and other rumors rather than her, um, her skill as a physician. Um, and there are no pictures of her face that we could find, and yet newspaper articles um, uh, defaming her are just abundant. Um, most of the stories that surround Dr. Griffin fail to highlight her professional career as a physician. Um, they just have much more to do with her unfit quality as a wife. And the climate of the early 20th century United States emphasized her domestic failings rather than her skill, again, as a physician. Um, she worked vigorously to build a reputation in the community as a respectable doctor. And the disgrace that she encountered was likely soul crushing. If we can learn anything from the from her experience, perhaps it is that women could easily be labeled as hysterical or deranged. And um, society at the time, unfortunately, held the power to derail their lives. Um, I'm happy to talk further about Dr. Anna Lemon Griffin if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um... Uh, as Lauren just said, there, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So I have both, as I said, the, the chat feature open and the Q&A feature open. Those are both available on the bottom of your screen. So please uh, feel free at this point to weigh in with any questions or comments uh, that you have. Um, there's also, you can raise your hand. It looks like according to the uh, interface I have here, I can allow you to talk, which is uh, a wonderful power. So if you'd like to ask your question out loud, uh, we can probably make that work as well. Um, while all of you are thinking up uh, some some questions for our panelists, um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments uh, uh, pretty quickly, and then I'm, I have a couple of questions that I can start things off with. Um, the, the first comment is just to say congrats to all of you. Um, it it's it's really quite impressive to 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 work through this material and to see how much. Um, how much you were able to find out about each of these people, um, the resourcefulness with which you did it, the kinds of sources that you accessed, you, you know, uh, you, you have census records, you have city directories, you have newspaper articles, uh, and sometimes you were able to fill in the blanks with um, sort of more general evidence uh, that allowed you to make um, you know, well-educated guesses uh, that, that could fill in some of the gaps, some of the holes uh, in the life stories of the people that you're uh, profiling, profiling these three women. So I was, I was, was really quite impressed with uh, how much you were able to come up with. Uh, it's, it's not easy. These are none of these people uh, are people that are sort of front and center when we usually talk about uh, uh, important people in history, notable people in history. In the case of this, since this is a project about notable women, um, you know. So congrats on on being able to. Uh, unearth as much as as you have. Um, I also really liked the way that you were able to use historical literature to contextualize each of these stories. Um, I, I was just sort of making a little tally of all the things that you sort of investigated in the course of of trying to put these these accounts together. Um, and so we had the histories of uh, club women. Um, um uh, you, you either two or three of you talked about life expectancy which was uh, i thought interesting and clever we we learned something about domestic service uh about the history of divorce about the history of drug use mental illness um and of course all of these are informed by sort of broad understandings of um the the specific uh, circumstances the specific challenges of facing women in late 19th and early 20th century uh, America. Um, so, so very well done, all of you. I really appreciate uh, uh, the work you put into this. Uh, the other thing I really like about this is that this is part of a collective effort, right? You're all in a class. Uh, You're all contributing to a larger project, which you, there are other groups in your class, I know, that also contributed to this project. Uh, this project is ongoing. So 
uh, we're starting to put together a really nice picture of uh, community life in, in Muncie in the late 19th, 19th and early 20th centuries. And, uh, um, and we're able to, from that picture, make some sense about broader patterns beyond just a single community uh, with this. So I wanna start off with what I'm hoping is a pretty easy question, a pretty uh, uh, unthreatening question, which is um, did, what was sort of surprising or difficult about uh, putting all this together uh, over the course of the semester, what was, um, uh, what, what did you find out that you didn't ex expect to, or what part of the process was surprising? Um, what part of it was difficult or hard to, uh, hard to achieve? Um, so any of you weigh in, I think you all should be able to turn your mics on. Um, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say like the hardest part for our project was really starting like when we were trying to get the family structure organized because we couldn't find anything about her father. And so that was kind of what we were gonna go off of. And we were, um, and one thing that made it really complicated was in the marriage certificates, um, it has like mother and father of Carrie Gillen Waters listed and it had her brother, Jacob, as the father. And so we were going back and forth between like, was her father's name also Jacob or what was happening? And in the end, we came to the conclusion that like he was just stepping in for the father. But um, that was definitely one of the more complicated parts, just trying to get like all of their jobs and stuff organized and really like think clearly about it, um, especially with like not knowing her real uh, birth year, that made it really difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, record keeping was not perfect by any means, and that's always one of the, the challenges uh, in, in putting together something like this. Mm -hmm. What about the rest of you? Oh, um, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't really, the, you, your audio sort of cut out. The question was just, um, what was it like the most difficult part of the um, project? Surprising or difficult? Surprisingly difficult, okay. Um, uh, in terms of surprising, and I guess also in terms of difficulty, um, just the amount of clubs and organizations that Josephine Pearson was a part of, it was both just astounding, like whenever we looked at a new article or anything, we just found some whole new like world that she was a part of, but it was also difficult because we had to keep together like a timeline of when she joined each thing, the function of each organization, um, her like position, because she had all sorts of, she was like a captain and a vice president and president and she had all sorts of positions. So I guess in one, that was the most surprising and difficult thing, just the amount of organization that Josephine was a part of. It's, it's quite remarkable actually. And it gives you some sense of how rich the associational life of the black community was in Muncie. It wasn't that big a group, you know, population wise, there, was, there weren't huge numbers of people, but that's an awful lot of groups that they organized uh, over the course of what a couple of decades, really. And she seemed to have been active in, if not all of them, an awfully big proportion of them. If there's one she's not active in, uh, I, I right. don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you can sustain your claim that she's the, the city's foremost black club woman. So uh, Linda or Lauren, either of you? Um. I think I think I mentioned this briefly, but the most difficult part of this project for um, me and my group actually was trying to find information about Dr. Griffin that was not claims by her ex-husband, um, because we didn't want to center our project around, um, you know, her husband and what her ex-husband and what he was saying about her and how she was supposedly crazy and deranged. Like we want to talk about her as a physician, and so. For the longest time, we really had to search because all the newspaper articles, except for maybe one or two, were about how she was crazy. And there's no pictures of her. So um, the court records were the most surprising thing, actually, and they're the most useful because we learned more about Dr. Griffin because we found those records. So I was going to ask you this later, but since you brought it up, I'll ask you this now. Um, I got the sense from your presentation that you were skeptical of the newspaper accounts that place all the blame on her. So talk us through a little bit about how you, well, first of all, uh, may, am I correct about that? And then if I am, talk us through how you arrived at that skepticism. So you're right. Um, 
Uh, I, initially, I wasn't skeptical of the articles. You know, that was the first piece of information that we had. Um, we were all given um, like one piece of information about our specific wom like woman, and ours was a newspaper article. But after I found the court case where she accused him of um, of like abuse, uh, what was it? I think like three years prior to him filing for divorce, divor I can't even say that word, divorce. Um, that's what really made me skeptical of his, um, his um, allegations because it, it almost seemed like a smear campaign, um, especially because she had tried to divorce him um, on grounds of um, abuse and um, she said that he had cheated on him and she was denied the divorce um, and he didn't want the divorce at the time but later he did and in 1903 after the court case after she was denied she like kind of went missing for three years we didn't know where she was for three years we couldn't find any information on that hmm. and um during the time of her being missing, um, we found that Kokomo article saying that she was running away from her husband. And that that came out before he started targeting her. So it, that's why I became skeptical of his um, accusations because of her in initial steps to get out of that relationship, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, yeah. It was the other thing I noticed, if I'm right, it, the print was a little small, so I'm not sure, but her husband's listed as a motorman in the city directory. Is that is that right? Yeah. So he works on, I think that's a railroad job. So there's a little bit of a sort of a blue collar versus white collar profession that was unusual in a couple. And you, you find yourself wondering if that mattered to the mm -hmm. relationship and to the to the, the conflict that, that arises there. Um, well, Linda, we haven't heard from you. Tell us about things you found surprising or challenging. What I found surprising about Carrie Gillen Waters when we were researching her was like, it was mentioned a lot in our project, was like everything she was allowed to do. One of the really surprising things is that she gained custody of a daughter that she adopted from one of her ex-husbands. So I believe she had like adopted it during their like marriage oh. and she ended up with full custody of this daughter. So I thought that was just like really interesting that like she was allowed to do that as a black woman during that time, as well as just like being able to attend school. We aren't quite sure what she went for. We would have to assume teaching or serving of some kind since that was pretty common for women then and at the Indiana Normal School, which was a predominant like teaching school. So I just thought it was interesting that, that she got to do all of those things as well as like working at the same time as a domestic servant. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, terrific, yeah. So, um, well, Dr. De Silva, I'm sure you're not surprised. Dr. De Silva has a question for you. Um, so let me read it off here. Uh, she says, thanks for the interesting and well-researched presentations each of which uses a wealth of institutional sources, census, marital, court records, newspaper articles, but hardly or comparatively few personal records. So how did you compensate for this lack of records um, uh, to get at the, woman, the, the woman's voice in each of these stories? Um, for Carrie Gillen Waters, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lot of it came out of the newspaper records that Virginia looked at, um, especially like, uh, the secondary sources that she looked at about the KKK and um, the view of divorce at that time, um, especially like we got a lot of newspapers about court cases that she was involved in about her divorces or the things that her husbands were doing. And so I think um, for, like compensating for lack of records, um, there wasn't much to compensate with in terms of like why they moved to Muncie. You know, we just looked at the brothers and their jobs. Um, but like, as for the rest of her life, even with school, we couldn't really compensate with much um, other than that it was a teaching school. Um, but yeah, for like her divorce and stuff like that, we just kind of um, used those secondary sources and the other newspaper articles and like what people, how people wrote about her and her divorces in the newspapers, because they sounded, they were just very condescending. And so um, just using those two kind of made up for her personal life that we couldn't find in other records. 
So Samuel, what about you with, uh, with Ms. Pearson? Sure, sure. Um, well, it's difficult. It's, it's really hard not to have like, like a diary or something, just like, like, that'd be so convenient if we could just have like this book of everything she felt in every single day for the whole life, but that didn't happen, um, sadly. Uh, but the strategy that my group employed was, well, we employed a few things. First, we avoided trying to say, this is how Josephine felt, or this is how we think Josephine felt about X, Y, and Z. Like, we didn't want to, like, even, like, speculate, I feel like, on her, like, how, on her feelings about any particular thing, um, because they, we, just, we didn't really feel like that was fair to her, like, to just push on what we, in our, our 21st century perspective, on what on her activities um but in terms of like making up for that lack of personal records one thing um my group really explored was the context we looked at common threads um in the lives of black women living in that turn of the century period living through um the muncie gas boom living through the great migration living through the club movement and so it was helpful to see um what other black women were doing how they were reacting to the movements going on at the time. And obviously Josephine's life had a lot of nuances and it wasn't exactly one-to-one, -one, but I think we could get a rough idea about her feelings just based on that context. Lauren, do you have anything to add on, on that? This question of getting at women's voice without, a woman's voice without the uh, access to personal records? Um, what's interesting for us is because we we couldn't you know exactly say how she was feeling or what she was thinking um but we with the evidence that we had we did come to the conclusion that she was under um uh, immense amounts of stress so that is something that we kind of used instead um but we tried to weigh as many options as possible for like how she you know what she was thinking how she was doing why she had moved around, why she was institutionalized. We tried to make it a little bit open, like there's several options. Maybe it was the divorce, maybe it was the breakdown of her career, maybe it was the um, allegations against her, maybe she did have a morbid addiction, like we don't know. So um, I guess that's how we tried to compensate for it. We tried to look at um, the evidence that we do know about her and we tried not to make any assumptions that um, wouldn't it be fitting or wouldn't it be, I guess, appropriate, um, or would be, yeah, that's what I would say. Good. Yeah. It, it's tricky, uh, in, in, a, in a, something that's as fraught as, uh, as that. Um, so yeah, so, so Dr. De Silva adds that context reported speech in newspapers, seeing women's thoughts and their actions are all good strategy. She's right. Like in the, in the case of, of Pearson there, you know, that we can reach some con reasonable conclusions, I think about her opinions. She supported women's suffrage. Um, she was an advocate of prohibition, it appears. She, she was obviously a, a person of strong faith, religious faith. Um, so there are assumptions uh, we can make. Um, so uh, our audience, uh, beyond Dr. De Silva, uh, has some work to do here in the last few minutes. So uh, the floor is open uh, for further questions. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to, to speak up uh, uh, in the time we have remaining till about 2.30. Um, while people are composing their thoughts and their, and their questions, I, I had asked already Lauren a specific question about, uh, about her profile. Um, I have one uh, for, for each of you. Um, uh, for uh, for Carrie Gillenwaters, one of the things that's really striking, and I didn't hear a full explanation for quite, and I don't know quite what to make of it, is that on the one hand, she is a you know really fairly highly educated person. Uh, she she attends um, college post you know does does post high school work, uh, which is unusual for anyone in that area. Yet she's also a domestic servant. Um, um, and so how do we um, explain that that's, that's not a, a, a normal combination for people in this period? Did you, did you gain any sense to why she's both as highly educated as she is, is also, also engaged in domestic service? I think that me and Anna probably have similar things to say, but I'll let her speak after this. I was going to add that I think 
that when we were looking to see when she started being a domestic servant, I'm pretty sure it was like pretty young in her life. So like before the time it would be appropriate to like go on to secondary or go on to like higher education. So perhaps she did that to make the money to be able to attend school. I think she also continued on okay. because she needed the money to continue like living. So I think she did both. I think she probably wanted to be educated, but would have to have come up with the funds somehow. And I assume she just followed in the steps of other things African-American women were doing at the time. Anna? Yeah, I found it, I found it really weird and maybe a little bit stressful that there wasn't as much information about her schooling because like we knew that she went there, but we didn't know she graduated. We didn't know if she, like what she had exactly studied. Um, Presumably she was trained to be a teacher. Yeah, so when we looked at it, it was um, like Indian normal schools for teaching. Um, mm -hmm. So we assumed that that's what she was doing. Uh, I'm sure it probably was. Um, one of the things that I kind of thought about um, was maybe like working for the Marsh family since she started at such a young age. And we, we don't know if she went on to work for other families, but if she maybe worked with the Marsh family that whole time, maybe she learned to read with them since she was, she was labeled as a nurse for the uh, Marsh family kids, but as well as like a laundress and other things like that. So um, maybe she had learned to read so that she could help them in their schooling. Um, but I was, yeah, go I was going to say they also could have paid for her to go to school so she could teach their children since she was with them all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably mm -hmm. a possibility. Yeah. And one of the things like um, and from the census records and stuff, we know that her uh, two of her brothers lived with them for quite some time. So um, it's possible that they were the ones to provide mostly for the family if she didn't continue to be a domestic servant after schooling um since they worked many different jobs as laborers um yeah we didn't see them move out for quite some time so uh, it's possible that they could have been like the main providers for them right right um yeah it's a it's an interesting mystery um uh, in uh, one of the things i wondered too is um if if class boundaries are a little more fluid in African American community, both because of it's small and because it's it's segregated. That the the that things that would be, um, you know, distinctive markers of class differences amongst uh, members of the white community are not maybe as salient in 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 the context of the black community, um, which is kind of the the thread that I want to pick up with Samuel a little bit here. One of the things that's really striking is if you look at Pearson's profile, all of these clubs, all of these organizations she's involved in, um, she is a person who is prominent in a civic sense. Um, that would be the profile in, uh, if, if she was white, that would be the profile of a, of a member of the middle class pretty consistently. Uh, and yet she's married to someone who's listed, it, it appears as a laborer, at least at the point in time when you consulted um, your, your sources. So did you um, get any sense of the uh, the degree to, or, or let me put it this way, do you feel like we should be talking about her as a member of the middle class or um, as a member of the working class, or, or do those categories not enter into it so much in a case like hers? That's actually a really good question. It's something that um, I didn't really think about much back when we were doing the project, um, you know, originally last semester. But in putting together this presentation that I've given here today, I really have thought about it. And it does seem like you can make a fair case for Josephine being of a higher, I would say, like socioeconomic status within the Black community of Muncie. Um, her daughters, well, we know her one daughter went to college. Um, we know that she gave this really elaborate, right. probably very expensive 17th birthday party for her for her other daughter. So, um, but despite that, you're, exact, you're exactly right. Um, her husband worked first as a mailman and then as a, uh, just at, do it as a laborer at a, the city ice and cold storage um, unit. So it doesn't really, there is a mystery there, like connecting the dots of like, what did she, was her own family maybe wealthy and she married, maybe her husband Taylor married into a wealthier family. Um, what I always think, what I think is interesting is that, um, Josephine's family, like her father and her mother who came to 
um, Indiana, they didn't work in a factory like other black migrants who came to Indiana at the time. They actually were farmers, which means they owned land in some capacity, which means they had the funds there to at least purchase land or like rent land or something. Um, but it is a really big mystery, her exact socioeconomic like status within the Muncie community. But I think um, you made a fair point, like the community is small in Muncie. Like today, I think the black population in Muncie is somewhere around, I looked this up, it's like 11% today. And I'm sure it was even smaller back then. And, you know, within such a smaller society, people can move more fluidly up and down, like more social mobility, I suppose. And um, it's just, it's, it is a weird, it is a very strange mystery um, that Josephine was seemed to be have like advantages in a socioeconomic sense like she didn't have to we we i found no record of her being employed in any capacity she um had the ability had the free time to take part in all these clubs in addition to being a mother mm -hmm. good point so yeah i it is a very strange thing um i wish i could tell you the answer um because i'm very curious myself i often think about like you know i wish i could just go back just step into the past and just to see what was going on, just to see, get one life, one day in the life of Josephine Jones Pearson, because it would be fascinating to see, you know, uh, what their house was like, what they were doing, um, what their life, what their life, their quality of life was like. But um, I think it's, I think you can make a fair case to say that she was a bit wealthier than her fellow black, like um, residents of Muncie, I could say. Yeah, there's there's an element of prosperity. It's a good point about the the party for their daughter and so forth, and and the education their children received. So, all right, now our our audience is chickening out. Um, they they're uh, I think just too intimidated by the quality of the work here. So um, I want to I want to just sort of open up one more thing to discuss, right? And, and in this, I want to broaden out a little bit. We've talked about the specific cases of these three lives, these three people. Um, but from this and from the research you've done, as well as from your awareness of the, the, the research that uh, your classmates have done, both in this panel and beyond, um, what, what can you tell me? These three women that, that we're talking about today, they all lived really close together. If you take a map out, um, they're all basically in or around the, the downtown of Muncie is where they live and, and worked. Uh, you know, the Marsh family lived right off the edge of downtown. They, um, um, the Gillum Waters family house wasn't that far from downtown Seymour Street is the same. Um, what can we deduce about the, the, the values of this community from these three case studies? What can we deduce about the character of social relations or the social categories that really mattered? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're asked to pull back and sort of say, these are the things that people living in Muncie, Indiana in the early 20th century cared about these are the distinctions social distinctions that matter to them what would you what would you say they are um i can go first uh if no one else finds i know i just spoke but uh it's really interesting that you mentioned that they all did live really close together and in fact that uh, uh, newspaper article i was mentioning that mentioned um josephine's daughter's 17th birthday party lists the guest and actually um the uh, two of the gillen waters were in ah. attendance at that uh, birthday party and were known to be friends of uh, the Pearson. So you're right, they lived in such close proximity and the community was much smaller and tighter knit. But in terms of overarching values, um, I see a few just from looking at uh, all our projects and um, with Josephine at the center of you know my project. Um, one I would think is um, faith, religion. I, it's a very common thread throughout African-American history um, up until um, the, uh, after the civil rights movement with the rise of, for example, Malcolm X and uh, that sort of like anti-Christian backlash. But before that point, a lot of African-American communities um, coalesced around churches like that of the Calvary Baptist Church and especially um, the black community in diaspora, like it was sort of in Muncie, you know, where there was a smaller group of people, a smaller black community that was just starting to grow. The church was like a beacon for them. It was like a center where they could come together and share, you know, their Baptist faith. 
um, which was different. I don't know exact, exact, the exact like, demographics of this, but I can assume there was probably not a lot of Baptists living in Muncie at the time. And those who were, were primarily um, African-Americans who came. So I say religion's a big one, but also I think just, um, just the sense that uh, there was a, there's a sense that among, among I think the black community of Muncie of like self-betterment in a sense, like trying to make, like the mothers and fathers were trying to make like their children's lives better than their lives that they led. And you can see that, um, you know, they're trying to give their children education. We don't know if Josephine ever got an education, but we know both of her children um, graduated high school and we know at least Nettie went to college. Um, and also you can see that in just, just the way Josephine was advocating or was an early political activist advocating for suffrage, advocating for prohibition. It's clear that there was a sense, there was a desire among these people to try and make, uh, to leave the world better than they found it for their children and their descendants. So uh, in terms of shared values, I think in overarching sense, I think that that's what I would say. Good, what about the others? I would say in like an aspect that relates to Carrie would be like bettering their quality of life. Like she was very adamant in making sure she got what she wanted legally. Like she advocated for both of her divorces. She advocated for the custody of that child. So I think that she, along with some of the other ladies were very interested in making sure that they got treated the best they could or got what they like deserved and like got the rights that they wanted. So I think that they, one thing that could like hold them together, hold the community together was like advocating for their rights and wanting to be more accepted and better in the community. That actually brings me to think about um, Dr. Griffin because she wasn't really involved in any, at least what we, we couldn't find any records of her being involved in any clubs, any churches, anything like that. Um, hmm, interesting. It, right um it was very like difficult to find information about her um and so but what you said like i think the not just like advocacy for rights but also just like that women deserve to be you know in good relationships you know um and i think that's interesting that you know like dr griffin knew that she like wanted a divorce she went and tried to get one, you know, like, and I think that's one of those things um, that could tie people together, or even, like, concepts of, like, family, even though Dr. Griffin didn't um, really have, like, she never had kids or anything like that. She went and lived with her family later, and earlier she was a family physician, and she, again, was caring for other women. I feel like there was this um, sense of solidarity among women, I guess. It's interesting that two of the three women, the, the most notable thing they did was get divorced, which tells us something about what, you know, how women are perceived uh, and, you know, what's important in, about their lives is when they violate norms and expectations that they get attention. So, Anna, do you have any thoughts on this before we wrap up? Um, yeah, I was going to say uh, as much as a value for some as it was a necessity for others was just working. So for like uh, for Carrie, we saw, and with many African Americans, we saw the uh, black migration to Muncie because of that gas boom. So they all saw these jobs opening up, and they all moved there because they needed to. They saw these jobs, um, but for like uh, Anna, Dr. Griffin, um, it wasn't. I I don't know. If I would. I don't want to assume, but like for her, it wasn't as much a necessity as being like a doctor, as much as she that was her passion. She wanted to be a doctor. Um, so I think that like we, so we see with Dr. Griffin, that's what she valued a lot was being a physician. Whereas like with Carrie and others, we see it's more of a necessity as like, uh, Carrie and her family, they were listed as having many different jobs. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, um, uh, this, this is terrific. Um, I really appreciate the work you guys have done, uh, in this class and, and I appreciate as well taking the time to share it today. Um, uh, congrats to you. Congrats to Dr. Silva for uh, the class's success as well. Um, thanks for your time.